Welcome back to Lockfall Labs. Today's video will be all about security pins, how they work and what they do for a lock. They're pins that essentially make a lock a lot harder to pick or open with tools other than a key. This includes bumping, raking, self-impressioning, and a few other techniques. They can be used in many lock designs, from this standard five pin lock that we've been using here in our example, to other high security locks that may even have multiple locking systems. Let's first give these pins some color to make them easier to distinguish. Green for driver pins on top, and blue for the key pins. You can see each general pin shape here, but we'll take a closer look at these one at a time in a minute. First, in stack one from the front of the lock, we have a serrated pin with tiny grooves cut into it, spaced evenly apart. Stack number two, you can see a standard spool pin, named for its sewing bobbin-like shape. Stack three has a T-pin, roughly similar in shape to the capital letter T. Stack four is called a mushroom pin. This one is modeled after ones often found in Medeco locks. And last, on stack five, we have on the top driver a barrel pin, which looks a lot like two spools sandwiched together. And on the bottom, in blue, our special key pin is called a torpedo shape, or a kind of spool. These pins may not be all commercially offered in a lock together like this. We're just putting them together for example purposes. Great. Let's swing around front and check out the interaction of each pin stack one at a time, as if we don't have any other pins in the lock. If we did try to fully simulate this lock with all pins, it'd be very difficult to see what's going on. So this simplification will help a lot with our understanding of these pins. So we start with pin one, which is our serrated pin. This is really the simplest security pin interaction. And you can see the multiple serrations or grooves. And if we press up a little with our pick, we'll get some light clicks rapidly in a row. This is obviously meant to be false feedback to a picker, trying to trick them into thinking that they have the pin set. As we learned in the past video, we usually press up on a pin waiting for a click. Well, this serrated pin attempts to give that click without actually getting you to the shear line, allowing the core to move. Usually this, these serrations are light enough that they can be defeated just by practicing and learning the difference between the slight tick, tick, tick and the nice big crisp snap once all the pins fall into the correct place. Okay, now we'll push back and move on to pin stack number two. and Check out a standard spool pin. This pin is by far the most common type of security pin in pin tumbler locks. They're in commercial locks and even cheap residential locks. You might have all standard pins with a single spool, trying to prevent some fast entry techniques such as bumping or raking. Or there are locks that have mostly spool pins. Typically you wouldn't have every pin be spooled. One is likely to be serrated or standard. Abus brand locks are a good example. They use a lot of spool pins, and they can be quite fun to pick once you get the hang of them. You'll notice I've added a red line for a core indicator here on the right side. This will help us visually track the core rotation. You can see if we give this lock some tension with a wrench, it would allow our core to rotate quite a bit and eventually come to a stop. This is about six degrees of rotation, but you can see it looks and feels like quite a lot. Lock pickers call this a false set. You can't really turn the core fully to open the lock, but you get the initial feeling like you're going towards open. But as we can see, there's no way to force the core to turn much more as the spool is blocking the shear line. If we were picking and got this false set, we'd be going and looking for some feedback by pressing on each pin. Let's see what happens. As we lift, watch the core rotation. The shape of the spool pin will force it back against your tension wrench. We call that effect counter rotation. Another way to think about it is that counter rotation happens when pressing a pin and you get opposite rotational feedback. In our case, we got a false set when going clockwise, so we get counter rotation feedback counterclockwise. With simple spool pins, you generally don't need to let up off tension much. If we just keep pressing further, the core will straighten out on its own, and eventually you get a normal click, just like a regular driver. There's some better made spools out there that you really have to let up off tension a lot in order to not overset your key pin. But plenty, you can just press up evenly and get a good set. And again, that counter rotation is what tells us we are on the right spool to pick. If we had other spool pins in the lock, 
as soon as you set this one, likely we would immediately drop back into a false set. Now let's move on to stack three, which is our T-pin. It starts out a lot like a spool pin, though it doesn't always give as much of a false set. A lot of that depends on the length of the top section of the pin or the cross piece of the T. If it's decently long, it won't tilt much in the Bible, but if it were very thin, then you would expect more tilting and a much deeper false set than what's shown here. Commercial locks don't really have extreme pins like that and generally prioritize reliability and maximum number of cycles under use. Challenge locks are named because they have custom pins which are much more extreme shapes than commercially available. And they may not be as reliable in operation, but they're meant to be a much harder challenge to other lock pickers. Usual requirement is just that they work with a key. All right, so in this case, you can see, if we give this pin a push up with our pick, we don't get much or any counter rotation. The bottom part of a spool is basically missing. So you get less feedback here than with a spool pin. You're really getting feedback similar to a regular pin, except we're in a false set. So if you're going through the lock looking for counter rotation, assuming you have a spool pin to find, you might overlook a T-pin. Luckily, as mentioned, T-pins are fairly rare when it comes to factory-made locks. Keep going, and we should get a set like normal. After a T-pin, generally, you would open the lock, but you could also have a very deep spool pin to pick. All right, on to pin stack number four. Here we have our mushroom pin. You can see we're kind of tapered towards the top, and we have that ridge near the bottom, giving it a kind of upside down mushroom look. The ridge can also be at the very bottom of the pin, but this pin is modeled after pins that are common in Medeco locks, which we'll be taking a look at in a future video. I'm also gonna add another highlighted area. These bracket shapes are to show that some counter milling has been added to this chamber. This is extra milling that is done to the core of the lock, basically a small channel added to grab edges of spools or serrations, or in this case, the ridges on our mushroom pin. It is intended to simulate a false shear line and again, give false feedback or defeat fast entry techniques. Counter milling can be light or extreme, and some of the best examples of counter milling are in ASA locks made by the huge ASA Abloy company and are very popular in Europe. Okay, so let's get into the operation of this set and we'll see how well it works. Giving a little push upwards and some tension, you would see we would get a little bit of a click and a slight rotation of the core. and Maybe even enough of a click to make us think that we had set this pin properly, likely moving on so that we would have to come back later. We'll stay and finish this one, assuming we knew it was happening. You can see the counter milling really grabbing onto the left side of the mushroom ridge. The angles are not perfectly matched. In other words, if we did give a hard push, it's possible that this one would counter rotate on its own. If the counter milling were shaped a little different, it would likely not counter rotate at all when pressed. Of course, that's a lot harder to make, so we're sticking with a common example here. In the future, I'll do a video on an ASA lock to show how the slight angle changes can make a big difference. So on this one, we might be able to just press up and get out, or we might be, have to give some manual back rotation of the core. This shows why simple tension wrenches that are somewhat loose in the core don't work too well with high security locks. You wouldn't have good control over the core in both directions, usually just in one direction. So a very tight fitting wrench is generally most ideal when dealing with complex security pins. So popping the pin up a little, you can see we get the other side of the mushroom ridge caught on the Bible. So let's rotate our core back a tiny bit manually and we should get this one set. If you noticed, we had a bit of an interlocking effect going on between each side of the pin with the core and the counter milling and then the Bible. Now let's move on to our last pin set which is also our most complex. Here we have a barrel pin on the top as our driver, and we can see a specially shaped key pin called a torpedo. I don't know, I think actual torpedoes are kind of straight, but this one ends up like a spool pin with tapered midsection. With the barrel, you can see that it's a bit like two small spool pins sandwiched together. The top part won't really have much interaction here. Some of these are just one-sided and then need to be installed with the spool part down but I think they're often two-sided just for ease of installation, so you don't have to pick the direction correctly. In any case, this is also another countermill chamber, 
So you can see the indicator marks are still there. Let's see what happens when we give this guy a little press. Almost right away, we'll drop into a very slight false set. This one is so well matched with the sharp corners that we for sure won't be able to force our way out of it by just lifting the pin. So again, the only way will be manual counter rotation with your wrench instead of an automatic counter rotation given by pressing a normal spool like we saw in chamber two. Sometimes this false set is so solid that even manual counter rotation doesn't work well. In that case, you usually need to use more advanced picking techniques to try to avoid the situation altogether. I'll get into these in another video later. For now, let's just move on and assume we can counter rotate manually. Lifting now fairly evenly, we can get this pin set, but we could also accidentally rotate our torpedo pin if we gave pressure to one side mostly. Instead, in this case, let's assume we keep pressing up after our set, or we had too much force on our pick, and our key pin flies past the shear line and gets overset. This situation is fairly straightforward with regular key pins. You can just pulse tension a little, and they usually drop right back down. But here you can see we would now go into another false set, very similar to our above driver and it would be hard to distinguish the difference. Now you might be thinking, okay, we got a false set. So how do we get out of this? Unfortunately, it would be hard to determine. Most other pins would be pretty frozen, except this one would only give a characteristic overset feeling. Pressure gets harder and harder the more you push, as you're now pushing against the top spring stack. The only way to really get out of this is to drop most likely all the drivers and start over. All right, so let's wrap up security pins. The basic idea is to produce a lot of false feedback to make both lock picking as well as faster entry techniques harder to execute or just take more time. Some we've seen here are both much more difficult to manufacture as well as to get around when lock picking. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up so I know to make more and consider subscribing if you want to be notified of future videos like this. Thank you.